Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue looking at distributed element filters by analyzing a type commonly built from pieces of transmission line, which are either open or short circuit terminated. These are also known as stub filters. Now, such filters can come in all shapes and sizes, but building from pieces of coax cable is usually a sensible option only above a few tens of megahertz when LC filters start to show their limits, but also below a few hundred megahertz when other constructive methods become a bit more practical. Now, fundamentally, a stub filter relies on a piece of transmission line's ability to create an impedance transformation. Based on its length, the characteristic impedance and the end impedance, the general equation for this accounts for complex impedances. But there are two specific use cases that are more well known. The quarter and half wavelength transmission lines. Here, the impedance is either inverted, an open circuit is transformed into a short circuit, and a short circuit is transformed into an open circuit when using the quarter wavelength line, and when using the half wavelength line, the same impedance is skipped. So a short circuit behaves like a short circuit, and an open circuit behaves like an open circuit. Now, if you have access to any transmission line impedance, you can create a lot of complex filters and responses. But the big limitation using coax cable is that you only have a few impedances to work with. Commonly available are 50 and 75 ohm impedance cables. Now, you can get a few more impedances by putting cables in parallel. So if you take two 50 ohm cables in parallel, these will behave like a 25 ohm cable, two 75 ohm cables will behave like a 37.5 ohm cable, and well, if you try to match a 50 and a 75 ohm cable, you get about 30 ohms. So anyway, these are the main building blocks and well limitations of coax stub filters. You only have a few transmission line impedances that are actually practical. Now, a stub filter simply means that from a central signal line, you branch off with a stub. Seems simple enough. Well, let's look at some common topologies for such a filter in the circuit simulator next. LT Spice, of course. So, just as an example, I took a basic 50 ohm, 5 nanosecond long transmission line, which behaves like a quarter wavelength at 50 megahertz and as a half wavelength at 100 megahertz, and I connected this to a 50 ohm signal source and a 50 ohm load. And to start things off, I connected the end once as a open circuit and once as a short circuit. So if we simulate this circuit and we look at the two output results, maybe just zoom in a bit, we see the basic behavior of this type of filter. The open circuit filter produces a dip at the quarter wavelength frequency, so at 50 MHz, whereas the short circuit filter produces a maximum response at the same frequency. And well, at double this, so at the half wavelength point 100 MHz, the behavior is inverted. Now, if we resimulate the circuit over a wider frequency range, we can see that other than the fundamental resonances, we also get higher harmonics. So at triple, five times, seven times, and so on. So we get all of the odd multiples. So it's important to remember that this sort of stub filter is not a single frequency filter. Now, the next thing to observe is how the exact transmission line impedance influences the filter's bandwidth. For this, other than the initial 50 ohm transmission line filter, I prepared an extra set of circuits in which I use either higher impedance transmission lines, so 75 ohms, or lower impedance transmission line, so 25 ohms. So if we simulate this set of circuits, and we only focus on the open-ended filters, we can observe that if the transmission line has a higher impedance, so in red we have the 75 ohm transmission line, the filter's response will end up being narrower. And if the transmission line's impedance is lower, so the 25 ohm version in blue, then the filter response becomes wider. Now, this is an important piece of information, since normally a filter is not just supposed to suppress one unique frequency, but rather a certain range, which can be wider or narrower, depending on the application. So the exact transmission line impedance 
will help you achieve the end goal. Now, one variation of the basic single stub filter is to add an extra stub, but of different length. This will create a extra dip or peak based on how the end is terminated. So just as an example, I added an extra seven nanosecond transmission line, which behaves like a quarter wavelength at 35.7 megahertz. And if we look at this filter, so let's just focus on the open-ended one, we see two dips appearing. So one at the previous 50 megahertz, but we now get an extra dip at 35.7 megahertz. Now you can add more than two stubs. So this filter also works with three or more. As long as there is enough separation in between the resonance frequencies, you will get a clear response. So when I also add an extra 10 nanosecond line, this is the response we're getting. We have an extra dip at around 25 megahertz, corresponding to the quarter wavelength of the 10 nanosecond line. Now, the last thing to look at is how a higher order filter can be built. For this, we will need stubs of the same electrical length, separated by a specific amount of extra transmission line. The interesting thing I found was that the exact length will have an impact on the final response shape. So just as an example, I added two stubs, 50 ohms, five nanosecond long in all cases, but the stubs are separated by an eighth of a wavelength, quarter wavelength, and half a wavelength transmission line, each length giving a different response. So if we simulate and we just look at the open-ended circuits, and also remove the phase. So the eighth of a wavelength in green gives a peak response below the resonance frequency. The quarter wavelength in blue gives a peak response above the resonance frequency. And while the half wavelength line in red doesn't give any peaks, but it also provides the widest bandwidth while having the least steep slope. So the exact length should be chosen based on the final desired effect. Now, one of the nice things about the simulator is that you can easily play around with delay and impedance values to get a specific response shape. And then with some external calculators, you can convert this into a cable length to be able to finally build the circuit. However, while looking for some online tools to aid in the design of such a filter, I found an interesting website which highlights one of the issues of this type of filter, impedance matching. So this is an online coax stub notch filter designer. Here you need to specify the notch frequency and then the tool assumes that the passband is at half this value. Next, you need to specify the type of coax cable that you have. So let's just select this one. And once you hit calculate, you get some results. So here you have three different filter topologies and for each of these, you have the either component values or extra stub lengths. And if you need more details on how these networks are supposed to look, these are detailed in the subsequent page. So with various measurements and so on. Now, the nice feature about this tool is that it doesn't just add a quarter wavelength line, but it also uses either discrete components or extra pieces of coax as impedance matching elements. So even though this is not a universal tool, it will not cover all use cases, it does put forward one of the issues of such a filter. So I do recommend that you check this tool out since it might come in handy. So the thing is that even though this sort of filter will create a nice notch at one frequency and it has no influence at another frequency, everywhere else it presents a complex impedance. We can easily observe this using a .NET statement. So when we simulate, we can right click on our plot plane and add the trace of input impedance as seen from the V1 signal source side, maybe also change to logarithmic. So by default, we can observe the impedance in polar form. So we see here that there is a clear imaginary component as shown by the non-zero phase shift. But as I just learned, if you right click on the magnitude, you can change the representation from Bode to Cartesian. And now you have a very clear, real and imaginary impedance component. So if you want to use this filter at any other frequency where you do not have an imaginary impedance component, you will need some amount of impedance matching. On the one hand to remove the imaginary bit, 
and on the other to get to 50 ohms or whatever the system impedance is. Now, one way is to use an LC type of impedance matching circuit. As an example, I chose two frequencies, 25 and 75 megahertz, so just above and below the initial filter's corner frequency of 50 megahertz, and prepared a set of matching circuits. Now, I once used a series inductor and parallel capacitor, and once a series capacitor and parallel inductor. And once we simulate, and we look at the output responses, we can make an interesting observation here. So, sure, we do have our correct response at the desired frequency, but you can combine the impedance matching feature with an extra filter response type, either a high or a low pass filtration effect. So, the complete filter will have not just a local notch, but also it will have a wideband high or low pass effect when this sort of impedance matching is used. So, finally, I decided to try and build such a filter for some sort of practical use case. One of the problems I've noticed when using blow cost ham equipment is the need to filter out the FM radio stations when trying to use the 2 meter band. So, let's try and build a filter just for that. So, a circuit that can attenuate by at least 30 decibels the FM band. So, starting in the simulator, I began with a basic single stop transmission line filter. And to get an ideal response of 0 decibels in the pass band, I also set the signal source to a value of AC2. So, ideally, only half of the signal will pass through, which is 1, so it will show up as 0 decibels. So, if we run this thing and we have a look at the output, we very clearly see the 0 decibels. And although this filter would work, the issue is the minimum attenuation that you're getting in the FM band. So, if we just put some markers at around 88 and 108 megahertz, we can see that the attenuation is only around minus 10 decibels. So, this is not really enough. So, the first thing to try is rather than having a 50 ohm transmission line, having a 25 ohm transmission line. So, two 50 ohm lines in parallel. If we do this, and we move our markers, we can see that we are getting a better attenuation. We move down to about minus 15 decibels, but this is still not enough. So, single stub filters will not do. We need a higher order filter. Now, because I want the response to have a peak right above the corner frequency, a quarter wavelength interconnection seems to be the most helpful. So, I redraw the filter with two stubs this time, and if we look at this thing, we do see our peak response after the filter, and if we move the two cursors, we are seeing a far better minus 22 minus 28 decibels of attenuation, which is still not enough. So, finally, I took the stubs and made them 25 ohm impedance. And if we look at this circuit, and we move the cursors again, now we are finally getting close to the minus 30 decibel range. So we are getting somewhere in between minus 34 and minus 40 decibels of attenuation. Now, you may have already noticed that the notch filter's frequency is not perfectly centered in the FM band. It is slightly shifted. Now, the reason why I did this is to have the response hump more or less exactly in the center of the 2 meter band. So, if we just look at the final filter, we can observe this hump is at around 144, 145 megahertz. So, even before any sort of impedance matching, this filter should be quite okay. We can, of course, check this using a dot net statement. So, if we look at the impedance at around 145 megahertz, we are getting 51 plus 1.5 J ohms. So, this is very close to the ideal 50 ohm value that we would want. We'll have to see if this actually holds true in real life. But so far with the filter, no matching is really needed. Now, the first part in building such a filter is measuring out some lengths of coax cable. For this, I used a basic calculation based on the type of coax. So, I'm using RJ58, its specific propagation velocity factor from the datasheet, and the delay I need and then added a couple centimeters because of tolerances. Then I took this, connected it to a SMA connector and to the 
light DNA and will slowly trim it piece by piece to get the desired length. So once you cut off a piece, the resonance frequency moves a bit higher. So cutting off more, it will move higher and higher. So just remember, you can always cut, move the resonance frequency higher, but you can never move it lower. For that, you will need a new piece of cable that has a longer length. So anyway, for my filter, I need a cable that has a resonance at around 97 megahertz. So somewhere around here. So I'll need to start over again. Anyway, once all of the pieces are cut and interconnected to form the final filter, you can start measuring it. And well, we are getting more or less the desired filter response. Now, while playing around with this, I noticed a quite interesting behavior. My double cables, so the 25 ohm transmission lines, change the behavior of the filter based on how tightly they are positioned. So when I pull these apart, the filter response slightly changes. Similar for the other cable. And at the same time, the two ends of the cable, depending on how far apart they are spread or how tightly packed together they are, again end up changing the filter's response curve. So the dip becomes smaller or larger based on how the exact filter is positioned. So I guess to some extent these particular cables are not perfectly shielded and while some signal is passing from one to the other and based on how the physical filter is distributed, the exact response will vary. Using better cables should prevent all of these issues. But anyway, other than the exact notch, the passband response, so the one close to 145 megahertz, stays more or less the same regardless of how the cables are arranged. Regardless, looking at the final result in more detail, I noticed that the exact peak response is slightly shifted from the center frequency of the 2 meter band. So rather than trying to extend the cables to move this frequency lower, I decided it was time to add the impedance matching. For this, I measured the complex impedance it gave a value of 58.4 plus 40.3 J ohms. And for this value, I got a matching circuit using an online calculator. Now, after adding the closest values I had to this into the circuit, so this is in line with my filter and in between the connector, the result does indeed seem to be better. So the matching does work. So, all in all, this is not a perfect filter, it still has an attenuation of about minus 1.1 decibels in the pass band, but at the same time, it also attenuates the entire FM band by almost 40 decibels. So it should be pretty usable. In the end, coax cable stub filters can be quite a useful construction when a narrow band high Q filter is needed at relatively low frequencies. These will offer the performance of a distributed element filter in a frequency range usually occupied by lumped element filters. And at the same time, it's also a fun device to build and fine tune. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.